So is on tape. Oh, all right, there we go. Well, let's go ahead and get this thing started. How is everybody doing today? Good. Better than an open face sandwich. Oh my gosh, Sean. <laughs> all right. You know, I don't know about the rest of you, but for the last eight weeks, I'm lucky if I have time. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get that there. This been, it feels, I don't know why, it felt so... It's not an open face sandwich, it's an open-ended ravioli. Oh, there you go. Eno just another, another piece of the puzzle. Like, it could be any of these. Complete food chaos. Uh, I don't know why, it's feel like forever since I saw you guys last. When was it? Was it last Thursday? Oh, yeah, Friday. We are, today, oh, my gosh, today is Monday. I didn't see you Thursday. All right, makes so much more sense. All right. How's there? Everybody have a good weekend? Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I got to take the jacket off because it's about to get crazy in here. Today we're talking about HTTP forms. I hope everyone's ready for it. I couldn't find a really good gift for this. So here is just, well, this poor, poor individual just tearing through this briefcase. I, sometimes you just feel like this some days. I remember corded phones. It's from good old days. Too. I think I still have one back in, really packed away. All right. Anyway, like I said, Kyle has only a few moments of energy here, so please hang with me about this. Oh, I'm sorry, was someone asking a question there? Okay, just wanna make sure. All right, got my coffee, I hope you do too. Grab those snacks, because we gotta go through a whole another lecture with yours truly. Okay. In order to do that, let's start hopping into the first thing. And I'm going to go ahead. It looks like, don't forget to please mute yourself if you don't have anything just right now. If you do have a question, you feel free to unmute yourself. But until then, please keep those on. I know it's sometimes hard. I forget a meeting sometimes. Honestly, my biggest fear is leaving myself unmute if I'm going somewhere else away off of meeting. I know I'm bound to do it one day. But we all know that greatest fear if you're on that mute and you're hoping where you're going in your house, you are on mute, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, let's go into this. HTTP forms, first starting out with announcements. As you all know already, probably, hopefully, assignment number four is due today. And I forgot to turn something on here, so let me go ahead and do that. So assignment number four is due. Hopefully you all enjoyed this one. This is getting into that HTML, maybe JavaScript, depending on how you created your sites. I got to work with a few students. So that was just really cool to see what you all came up with. I love seeing it every time. It is about your creativity and about you as an individual and using code to express that. So it is very awesome to see what everyone comes up with. Perfect. Um, also, as someone already called out, take a look at assignment number five. Assignment number five is not as fun as assignment number four, but not as not fun as assignment number three, but it is something you should definitely take a look at. It is something that might or will probably use a little bit of critical thinking. So take a look at it sooner rather than later. Additionally, I did see a question in the chat. and just want to make sure I reiterate on that, that all assignments across the board on your Canvas or in structure, I forgot what the actual terminology is, uh, should have a one at the end by assignment number six. All assignments do have to be turned in and completed and graded in order for you at, uh, you to move on to the next unit. So not every single assignment is a drop assignment per se, but by the end of the class, every assignment does need to be turned in and graded and have that one in Canvas. If you have any questions, feel free to call out uh, to Mark, but just wanted to just put that in there real quick so it's in the back of everyone's mind. Besides that, that is all the announcements I have. So, and then of course, code review tonight. If anyone was in the code review last week, let's see how more fun we can get it this week with more codes, uh, with more forms and HTML. So I'm gonna pause here. Any questions or anything whatsoever about announcements? See one person typing here, so we will do that. And as long as it's not about an open face sandwich or a burrito or any sandwich or any food as of right now. Cause that will just make me hungry. I believe you can unmute yourself too if anybody wants to yell. Just not too loud. So after today, we should be good to start assignment number five. I don't know for sure. I'm going to say yes, mostly yes. Today is going to be bringing in a lot of the concepts that we're going to be using in assignment number five. There might be one small tidbit in fetch our next chapter that we might have to look at. But besides that, yeah, you should be able to work on assignment number five. 
Um, Clark, if you are on the call or any TA uh, wants to chime in and tell me I'm absolutely incorrect, please let me know. But I believe we will have enough understanding to start looking at assignment number five. All right. Any other questions? Oakley Doakley, let's go ahead and get started. As always, I haven't heard your voices enough today, so let's go start with you all telling me how do we begin creating a website? What is that tag we start with? I hear somebody. Uh, the I think I heard a doc type. Awesome. Doc type is the very top tag that we use. What is the next tag that tells us where we start our website? It's technically not a tag. I read. Okay, so I heard a lot of things there. I think I heard HTML, so we'll call that. Raiden, did you have a question about that? Yeah, I think on um, the W3 schools, it said that the doc type declaration technically isn't a kind of tag. It is not. No, it is not really a tag. I call anything really between the pointy brackets a tag. Essentially, if you use a terminology tag to any HTML developer, they'll know, understand what you're talking about. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I don't exactly know what the doc type at the very top really is called. So if you actually have that information, I'd love to hear it. Maybe. If you don't want to tell me, feel free to direct message me because I always just love hearing exactly the correct uh, terminologies and names for things. So if anybody has that information, feel free to throw it over to me. I do love learning about that. I hinted, or not hinted, very secret. Don't tell any of your other colleagues or don't tell all the TAs. I never put my doc type at the very top. You don't have to have it up there, but it's not essential, but you should definitely, definitely keep doing it as you go through your assignments. So I haven't really worked too much with it. Anywho, awesome little sidetrack there. I do want to know that term though, right? And for real, please do send me that information. We're going to continue on. What are the only two tags that go between the HTML tags? The body. Body. And the header and body. Yeah. Now, the body is correct. Header is something different. What is the other tag? Do I have a header? Remember, HTML is what we see. It is about our body and our head. Our head. Head and header are two different things. Head is what we have on the top that controls our metadata for our website. And the body is what we see. So that's a big thing. If you try to put header up there, that would not be the correct tag to use. Header is another tag. Hence why I'm being so, so specific about this. So head and body. Head and body, very good. So let's continue on here. If I wanted to give this site the title of pet store, what would I do? You put the title in the title. body. Where do I put the title tag? In the head. 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 Our name, our titles consist up in the brain. We tell people our names, but all that information is up here along with our personality and our other metadata about ourselves, all in the head. All right. Tell me a little bit more about this. Does this go here? No, no, no. No, it absolutely does not. It goes in the body because it's something that we see. It's something that we see. It's not about the site. It's about what the site's trying to present to us. So no, it will go in the body. Very good. Let's keep going here. Everyone's doing awesome. How would I utilize a JS file called mycode.js into my HTML? Now put it between style, uh, between script. In the head. So I heard it. Where does this script tag go? Let's in the head. Very good. The head. Awesome. Awesome. So I started out with script here. Keep talking me through it. SRC. SRC or source. Very good. Source. That attribute. Yeah. And then we include the JS file that we want to include uh, that we want to have in our site. So in this case, it says mycode.js. In the very end then, and actually this is actually a typo and I apologize, we'll have the closing bracket and then script tags actually have just a partner where they'll just say open bracket slash script close bracket. So I apologize, that's a typo there. Typically script will, it will also auto generate for you most of the times a separate script tag. That is a more common practice than this. So I apologize for that. But the biggest thing to note is that SRC is the attribute we use to connect our JavaScript file with our HTML. Awesome. Now, and we were wondering where that H1 goes. Of course, it goes down there in that body. Remember, H denotes header and one denotes the size, where one is the largest and six is the smallest of that heading text. 
Awesome, awesome, awesome. So my question to you is, does this go here? Can this go here? Yes. Can what go where? So what it we could. saw is below H1, another line went there. Yeah, it could go there, but that's not a bit best practice, right? Yes and no. The answer is yes. Our script tags can go both in the head and also the body. We can put this there and it will run the console log whenever we do execute our site. However, you're also correct where we don't typically want to put scripts directly in our HTML if it can be avoided. We want to put them in separate JS tags. So to answer this, yes, technically it can. The script can go in the head and the body, but we do want to stay away from it if it is avoidable. I've actually seen awesome. script inside of a body though. Like I've seen it inside of the body HTML code. Absolutely, it can definitely be there. It can definitely be there. It is just mostly practice to try to keep JS in its separate files, just for better structure of your websites. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with putting that script in there if it needs to be in there. Sometimes a lot of examples out on the web will combine script and HTML into one file. However, as you get into larger applications on the web, you do want to make sure that you keep all that JS, that JavaScript in its separate folders or files, so you know where to find that code instead of scrolling through multiple websites or multiple HTML files to try to find it. Also, it assists in reusability for your code into the future. Say you write two of the same functions, or excuse me, if you have a function you wanna use on multiple HTML pages, it's better practice to have that in a common folder, or excuse me, a common file, so you can share it between multiple other HTML files. I think I thought I saw that, there we go. Got one question here. I was confused about the head versus the header tag. Can you explain what the difference is? Absolutely, the head is what goes between the HTML tags. The head consists of all the metadata or the information we don't really see about the website. What does the website contain? What kind of information is there? It's kind of what Google would use or another search engine would use to kind of see exactly what your site might all be about before actually going into the body to see what you're visually showing to users. So the head, contains information about the site. A header tag is something that a user sees. A header is what we see on the top of a website. If we come over to a website such as, mm, have we got a favorite website out there? Google. <laughs> oh, Google, never been to it, let's go. All right, our header would technically be up here about store. This is a header right here, something we visually see. If we right click, press inspect that we saw last lecture, we go into the elements, we go to its head, Google has a ton, a ton of metadata. Also script tags and also stylings. This is things about the site here. I'm sorry if the text is a little small, I can't really do much about that just right now, but feel free to go to Google, right click and press inspect to see it on your own machine. I have a question so the, actually. Yeah, Jody, what's up? Why doesn't Google, so you're saying it's got like style, and I've seen this. Why doesn't Google have the styling stuff in a CSS document and separate from the HTML code instead of sticking it right there in the HTML? Like why, why not have a CSS document that has all the styling? Um, I'm trying to see where you're saying that it's directly styling it. Are you saying that well, you you've seen, seen Like I've seen that, like a less HTML, uh, less head, and then right under that, style, left brace, blah, 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 blah. But why wouldn't you put that in a CSS document? Why would you put that right in your? Um, for this one, I don't particularly know exactly. Most stylings will hold off into a different file somewhere else. If it's very simplistic styling to increase loading page, so you don't have to wait for styling to come back from a different link, they can possibly directly inject it into Google's uh, homepage. So it could be about optimization since the Googling homepage is so simplistic that it might not require a lot of styling. Some very detailed pages do require a lot of styling. Maybe we're trying to use Google text, et cetera. So those might be a better use case to using external style sheets. So to answer your question, I don't exactly know. It could have been for optimization reasons or just an unknown reason that I don't know about the why the Google developers are doing it the way they are. One day, hopefully, we'll find out. Google always likes to give us recommendations down the line. But th does that kind of help uh, giving some kind of clarity there? Yeah. 
Um, okay. I also the answer is I don't at, know. <laughs> I looked at like but. YouTube, so like I inspected an element. I was doing this last night. Um, I inspected an, a tab element that is part of YouTube's whatever, and it doesn't have like it has a whole bunch of extra stuff that doesn't really make any sense. It's all just like a bunch of alphanumeric letters and a bunch of stuff I don't understand. Like, I don't understand what all that is supposed to be. So depending on what you're looking at, it gets a little bit more tricky about what sites are actually doing. But remember, we have to keep it as lightweight as possible when we put our website out on the out in the web. So there's actually tools out there that developers use to simplify code before it's actually put out into the public realm or out onto the internet. So if you're looking at weird things, like you have no idea why some code looks the way it is, they could be because they are transpiling their code into a more simplistic form before actually publishing it. That's why it's harder to learn styling from more well-used sites like this instead of like W3 schools or something like that because they're actually using more additional tools to help them out on the development side to make their sites the best they can. So to answer your question, it all depends on the site and what you're looking at, but that could be a possibility of why the site looks really weird to you whenever you actually inspect it or to anybody in general. I mean, right now this looks absolutely bonkers to me because I'm not looking at it in a, in a beautiful sense, in a beautified way, which just means well, opt, uh, well formatted. So great question there. And I'm happy you're tell, talking like all these questions because today is about forms, but it's also about HTTP, AKA the internet. So I see we have some questions being typed out. Go ahead and keep typing those questions out. I'll see if I can get to them, but I do want to dive into our lesson today so we can start actually talking about what's going on with all of this stuff we're going to be working with today. So I'm going to sip a coffee here. And we just looked at a lot of things, but today is the day I really want to try to lift up the curtain on what we use from a day to day. Um, excuse me, what we're using day to day aka the internet. So let's go ahead and talk about how the virtual world actually works. First things first, you are all looking through me through a device, aka your computer. Maybe it is a cell phone right now, but let's hope you're in front of a laptop like I am right now. So what we just saw, when we see our desktop or you go to a browser, you're going to see your HTML. You already know that your HTML is in this computer. You're able to actually see what you've created. And that's awesome. We're able now to visually create things in our browser so it compiles, whatever, and somewhat, at a sense, we can interact with it too, which is really awesome. So when we take this HTML, it's, it's turned into an actual image here on our browser. That's amazing. But one big thing we need, we all know this, and it's in the back of our mind, we really need to come to terms with is that we do not have the entire internet on our computer. The entire internet exists out there in space in something, but we do not have it on our machine. So though our site, even if we unplugged our ethernet cord right now, still works, not every site would do that. So let's talk about exactly what's going on there. We have our computer and you do this every day. You're gonna type in a website name and you want some information back. That's awesome. So when you press enter on your URL bar, and when I say URL bar, I am talking about the one right up here, something absolutely magical happens. What you are doing is that you are trying to talk to somebody that has all the information that you want. I and the person behind the computer say, I want my website.com. Who I'm trying to talk to that has that information that I requested is called the server. It's called the server. So what I do is I say, hey, I want my website.com, specifically that URL there. The fun thing about it is that it is called a request. I'm requesting that information from the server. So when I do that, of course, if I request something, that server hopefully talks back to me out there. Remember, this server is somewhere out in space and we are trying to get information from it. So we request that information, website.com, and what it does, because it's a very nice server, is that it sends us back exactly what we're asking for in a thing called a response. Once that response comes back, that's when we actually see what's on our screen. So let's talk about that one more time here. If you type in a website.com, we send over that request to a server 
somewhere out there in the world that's holding that information, that website, basically hostage. You're like, I want that information. It's like, okay, you asked for it nicely. Sends it back, and that's what we visually see on our screen. Again, if we want to go to yahoo.com, like back in the old days, if you're a 90s kid like me, this is a good website back in the day. What I just did is when I press enter on yahoo.com, it sent out a request to the Yahoo servers and it responded back with the Yahoo website. Again, if I do Google, exactly happens again. That's what's going on when you are asking for, them, yeah, for things or websites through your URL. Now, we are looking at two sides of the coin here. You right now are in front of your computer. That browser is called the client side. You are the client to that server. The other place or the other side of the coin is called the server side. This is extremely important to note these two sides because I will refer to one as the client side or your UI or your computer, the thing that you're looking at. And I will refer to the place where all that information is being stored, especially into unit two as the server side. So if you're a person who likes to take notes, these are two that I highly recommend. This client side and the server side are things that we're gonna be talking about. Now, now that we know the two sides of this conversation, we need to really look into how this conversation is actually, excuse me, is actually taking place. We know, we noted two main keywords here. The first one is request. I am asking for a website. I am requesting a website. When I'm requesting that, we are sending it through a protocol, a way of talking to another server. If everyone is talking different languages on the web, there is no way we will ever get information back. If I try to go to a German website and we are, he's, that website's trying to talk in German, I'm trying to talk in English, there's no way we can do a communication cross. Hence, the entire web is built on a protocol called HTTP, Hypertext, oh my gosh, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Sorry, I'm trying to go here. So when that request is sent over, it's sent over in HTTP. That response, or excuse me, so we will go ahead and explore that, what exactly is going on with that HTTP request. So let's go ahead and take a closer look. Looking at our site here, we are talking, or you know what, actually I'm gonna pause here, because I'm realizing I didn't give you guys a lot of information there. And I apologize. I'm gonna pause here. Any questions about what we just saw here about the initial conversation we're having between our client side and our server side and how our websites actually get to our screen. All right, just wanna make sure. And let's go ahead and keep on going. Sorry, yeah, okay, I did. Sweet, sweet, sweet. All right, so now that you know how the conversation initially gets <laughs> gets talked about between that client side and server side to get that skirt to get that website back to you let's go ahead and talk about it in a little bit bigger picture we have our ui right here and we have our server we'll bring them back in not a problem there but like you know google is not the only thing out there yahoo is not the only thing out there there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of different servers out there there is a lot of computers out there just waiting for you to send them a request so they can give you back information. Now, this is a pretty big, pretty big picture here, a pretty big situation. Just picture all those computers out there. There are, like I said, a ton, a ton of computers out there. So if I'm asking for my website.com or whatever, how the heck is the internet going to know where to find this thing? Just think if you had to go through the entire Library of Congress or something for one page in a book. That is basically what I'm doing here. I'm asking for one website in a huge pool of websites. The only way to do this, if I even asked you to go find your friend in a giant neighborhood, how would we exactly do that? The, the fix to all of this is that everything has an address. If you're trying to find something, the best way to find it is with that particular address. Now, instead of you trying to find your friend by just a street number and a name, instead, we have something different. We have all of these numbers here that are associated with our servers. A ton of different numbers. You, in fact, as well, have a number associated with you. Your computer right here, your home internet, has a particular number associated with its own address. This number 
is called an IP address, Internet Protocol Address. This is how everybody is identified in the web, where you are in this giant web. Not your location particularly, but your location in this giant, magnificent thing we call the Internet. So everyone has an address. So if everyone has this address, what the heck does this mean exactly? It's still website.com. It does not have a number associated with it at all. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. This website.com is called a domain name. You've seen them out there, google.com, whatever, amazon.com. I was on that way too much today. Everyone knows what domain numbers are, or excuse me, domain names are. The address we just learned about was called an IP address. These are very much closely related. When you type in a domain name, it needs to be converted into an IP address. How we convert these things into an IP address is with the DNS, the domain name system. It's how we take something that's human readable, a very cute domain address out there, and turn it into something that computers can actually utilize to find that website you want out in the world. So again, it's taking that human readable, cute little URL that we've created for ourselves and transforming into something that a machine, a computer, a server can understand. So that right there is a high level of DNS. Now, now that we know this information, real quick, I'm gonna pause. Any questions about what we just saw there? Bring it back because this is a lot. This is how the internet is truly working here right now and today. And I keep hearing my stuff go off, so I had to keep pausing. Okay. Any questions on any of this that we just heard so far? All right, then let's keep going. We now know how our URLs or our domains are being turned into those addresses that everything is located at. So let's go back to this screen that we saw here. We have our client side and the server side, both sides of that coin that are having that conversation. Remember, our computer is sending what over to our servers? It's that request. When we type in that URL, we send over the request. That URL under a certain type of protocol, which is HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. When that request is sent over, it is transformed into an IP address. That IP address then finds its server out there on the web, thanks to your ISP, internet service providers. If anyone ever has a problem with Spectrum, that is one of your favorite ISPs, as well as other things out there that I'm not gonna go too much into. But eventually, like I said, it's a giant web of ISPs out there that will finally find your server. But once that server is found, that connection is made using TCP or UDP, either one, whatever kind of transfer protocol that you want to talk about, a response is finally sent back. This is what we care about. We want the response back. I want my website. I want my cute little puppy on my browser. So it sends back the information to us. Now, this information doesn't come back in visuals. Remember, it comes back in the form that we wanted to, in this case, HTML. HTML. When HTML comes back from the server, is then presented to us in our browser on our screens. So right here is the true way every time you click enter on that address bar, on that URL bar, your information gets to your screen. And this is absolutely extremely critical to know all of this. This is what we deal with as developers from day to day. Because not the entire world, not the entire corporate um, corporate environment that we might work in one day is on our machines. We must talk to other machines and this is how it happens. So, I'm sorry about that. I clicked a little bit too much quickly there. All right. So, now that we've seen this, I'm going to dive just a little bit deeper. I promise we're almost done here. We're going to talk about this request. Remember, when you're sending over a request, you're having communication with another server somewhere anywhere in the world. We all talk in the same language using that HTTP protocol. So when we send over requests, we can have multiple, multiple types of requests. Even when you're asking somebody for something, you can have multiple types of way you're gonna ask for it. Like, can you hand me this? Can you do this for me? Can you do that for me? We can have multiple types of requests when we're asking somebody for something. Same with computers. 
the two types of requests we're going to be talking about mostly in these next few classes are as such. When we are asking for a website, the type of request we are sending over is called a get. A get request gets us something to show us information, to show us a website. So when you press enter at google.com and it shows you this, you just sent over a get request. You just sent over a get request, again, to see something on your screen. Now, we got information, but what if you wanted to send information over to a server? For that type of information, or for that type of transaction, we use a different kind of request. I wanna give you something. I wanna post something to you. This post here is one of the newer ones we really wanna take note of. It is how we send information over to a server. We post information over to it. So remember, get is how we get information to view a website or as such, whatever, whatever kind of information you're trying to get over to you. But if I'm trying to send information to the server side, I'll use a post. All right, everyone take a deep breath. Deep breath, deep breath. Any questions on what we just talked about? Anything at all? So hold on. So so like um like for assignment four, right? When I was testing, if I just load HTML like index.html, like if I just click on the double click on that, it will open that in my Chrome browser and it will display what my code has. Um mm -hmm. so I'm just curious, is it resolving to my local host basically? Is the DNS just resolving to my local host in that case? Is it just so you wouldn't actually even leave your local machine? Because when we do open our they uh, our um, our h or our index .html, you are just staying in your local machine here. So you won't even yeah, go yeah, out so, into the world. So, so it doesn't even resolve. Okay, so I just thought maybe it might resolve to my local 127.0.0.1 or whatever. No, no, in this case, we're just actually your browser will just look on your local machine. It won't even try to do any local host stuff or try to set up any kind of yeah, ports or anything like that. It's literally uh, just see. going directly to that file. Okay. A great question there. Yeah. Trust me, in the future, you and localhost will definitely be getting acquainted, but right now with just that HTML me stuff, it's just looking at the direct file. So any other questions? Anything at all? Everyone feeling how is everyone feeling about the internet now? Like is everyone just like shutting their laptops like now I'm giving up on it? Like that's way too that's way too much. Not really. It's just interesting. Okay, I'll take interesting. I'll take interesting. Mm -hmm. No one's yelled at me. Yet. I was like, what is this? So, I mean, that's good. No questions about it at all. All right. Feel less like an interloper. What was that? I said, I feel less like, I feel less like an interloper. <laughs> I feel more like a participant. <laughs> well, it's good. Also, <clears throat> the biggest thing about it, too, is that like when you do lift up these curtains, the one downside about development is that the curtain does get lifted on some of this stuff. It's like, ah, oh, the magic's not there anymore. When I do game development for a bit, like the curl, whole curtain gets lifted on the games. It's like, I know how they're doing this now and just not as cool. So it's the, it's the pros and cons of becoming a developer. But I'm hopefully everyone did find it interesting. All right, take that breath, take a deep breath and let's chillax just for a moment. Which fruit is not naturally occurring? Tangerines, palomos, or oranges? Cue Jeopardy music. Uh, tangerines? tangerines. Mellows? I think it's Oh my palomos. gosh. It was oranges. What? <laughs> oranges, right? Bam, mind blown. There they are. Everyone's woken up now, right? I forgot what it was. It's a mix actually between Oh, I think it is tangerines and palamos or something like that. It's a mix between two fruits. Yeah, oranges are not naturally occurring. That orange juice is a lie. It's a no. lie, everyone. No. It's I know, I can't believe it. I have to look it up. <laughs> no, look it up. 
Look it up. It might be true. I'm now I'm fingers crossing it's true. Because I oh, it, up. it says you oranges it don't naturally it. exist in nature. That's so sad. Look <laughs> how orange juice is made. I drink orange juice. Like, wow. Yeah, look how orange juice is made. The taste is artificial, the flavor is artificial, and they use tons of ammonia in the process. Basically, it's an use orange a resembling thing. Look into the process it's made. It's horrible. No. What? what? If you buy 100% orange juice, right? Better not think it's saying. <laughs> It's 100% orange juice, is a lie. Orange juice is, orange is a lie. Oh Cow eyes would God. be considered beef, wouldn't it? <laughs> Thanks a lot, Kyle. You're welcome. I'm sorry. It's ruined <laughs> breakfast for everybody. All right, let's keep going here. Maybe I can do it a little bit better. The blob of a toothpaste uh, that sits on your toothbrush is called a what? Dollop. <laughs> Dollop. Oh my it's Any wrong. Anybody got this one? Oh my gosh, it's called a nurdle, a nurdle. Copy these down, you never know when they're gonna come useful in trivia. No. How did I find that one? I have no idea, absolutely no idea. It's been That's a year a now. That's a horrible sounding word. my <laughs> mouth. <laughs> <laughs> the original stage version of the, uh, the, wonderful, <laughs> the wonderful Wizard of Oz, Dorothy's pet companion was actually a what? A dog. A dog? Cat. <laughs> It was a cow. A cow? <laughs> it was a cow. And that it was, was a Kyle moving every... story. I know, right? <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm sorry. I just ruined Wizard of Oz for everyone and Orange. I Jones. like the dog. I don't like the cow. I mean, the cow. I don't even put the cow <laughs> team dog. Yeah. Yeah. You're really milking oh. this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, who was that? Who just said that? <laughs> Yeah, it was me. Good one, Ann. Oh my gosh. That <laughs> wasn't me. Uh uh. Who was that? It was. Oh, all right. It was Amy. I'm sorry. It was Amy. It was Amy. Sorry, both of your boxes popped up at the same time. I was hoping Amy, for a spit take job. there because you were drinking water. <laughs> you I got really close to it. You got that was good. Really. Good. Said I just all right. Time. That was really close. <laughs> All right, everyone, bring it back in, bring it back in. Let's keep on going. So we just blew our minds with the internet, blew our minds with orange juice, blew our minds with a cow. Now it's time to bring it back into reality and unblow our minds with some of the fun stuff we learned last lecture. When this happens, everyone take a quick gander here. When I take my mouse and I click on a button, what exactly happens? An event. Very good. Absolutely right. An event occurs. An event occurs. Remember, when you click on a button, when you do a lot of things on a site, events are occurring. Even when you move your mouse, that is an event. Something is happening and your user might be trying to interact with you. So yes, an event is occurring. Let's bring in an ID in here. I'm going to call this button my ID. If I wanted to create something to listen for this event, what would I do? You and an event, event listener. listener. I like that idea. Talk me through how to create one of those things. You What's the first thing we need to do? ID. ID equals whatever you want it to, whatever you want the event to be. So it'd be ID. Yeah, it's equals like ID dot add event listener. ID so equals I, add event time. Yes. I like all that. Nope. First things first, what I'm looking for is that we need to find the element. So to do that, I'm going to go ahead and create exactly right. I'm going to go ahead and create a variable here called my button element equals two, and then I need to find the element. How am I going to find the element? Talk me through that one. Document document dot get element. Very good. Go ID number. Dot get I'll element get. by ID, and then yeah. inside the quotes we say my button. That's how we get the actual element. To create an event listener, first things first, you need to actually find the element you want to attach it to. So we did that there. My button element, awesome. Now that we have this, go ahead and tell me how to through, through to creating that event listener. Then it's my button, my dot button add element. event listener. So in this case, it's going to be my button element dot event element. listener. Why I'm being really precise there is because I actually have that typo in here. So I apologize. <laughs> it should be my button, uh, my button element dot add event listener. So we have that parentheses in there. What's next? Your parameters. What's the parameter? We, the first parameter that we are going to put in here? Click. 
Click. click. Click. The event we're looking for is click. Very good. And then what comes next? A function. function. Very good. The function, whatever we want to actually do. Awesome, awesome. So that is exactly what we want to see here. Now, let's go ahead and continue on. So we just saw one type of an event. We have learned about buttons, but there are multiple different ways to interact with our sites. So the next thing we're going to be learning about is actually how to have users interact with their sites in more than one way. One very common way that we see on websites is a thing called the text box. This is a type of input on our websites. So when you hear types of input, this is one way we do it. It's an input tool here. Text box. Of course, hopefully everyone has used a text box before. What we do is insert text into that text box. This is one type of input here. Another type of input is called the checkbox. A checkbox is where we can select one or many of the possible items within it. And then the third one I want to introduce us all to is the radio button. The radio button is like the checkbox, but instead of being able to select multiple, you're only able to select zero or one of the options. Those are the only possibilities in the radio buttons. These are the three types of inputs that we're going to be talking about today. If we get to some other ones, we can definitely take a look at them. But these are the three main ones I want us to focus on right now. So what we want to be able to do is that we want to include these in our site. So what I'm going to actually do, if everyone or if anyone is following along, feel free to do so. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to be using lecture 15 from last week in our examples for today. So I'm going to go and open that up real quick. What I have here. If you want to, go ahead and I have created a new branch for everyone to work on if you want to go ahead and follow along. So that branch we're going to be calling is uh, the lecture 16 dash forms. I haven't checked it out just yet. We will in a moment. If you don't see this on your project, remember always run your git fetch to bring in the latest branches. That being git f-e-t-c-h. And we'll fetch all those newest branches. So what I want to do is I'm going to be checking out the lecture 16 dash forms branch. What I'm going to do there is I say get checkout and then lec 16 dash forms. Press enter and we have now switched over to that branch. Now, just for full circle here, I'm going to go ahead and query, open up our Visual Studio code. I'm going to go ahead and open up our lecture 15 pet stores. It's just there in my recents. I single click on that and I see that I've opened this up. Awesome. Now, in the lecture, 15 or sorry the lecture 16 forms one that we're talking about today i have created this new user application.html file that we're going to be using today before we hop into this example what i'm going to do is just show it real quick i'm going to refresh and i see fill out application we are getting so close to adopting stark it's awesome today we're going to create the actual application itself in order to try to do that I'm going to go over here and click on fill out application. And I see that nothing here has been inputted other than a nice giant title that says fill out the form for a furry friend. Try saying that five times fast. All right. We're going to hop over here to our code. I'm going to full screen that for us. And because I know we've gotten that before, I'm going to go ahead into preferences very, very quickly. And setting, there we go. Um, Just increase that to 14 there. Awesome. Go back over to our code. Exit out of that. Awesome. All right. We are in user application.html. Awesome. So we need to create an application to actually try to adopt Stark. That's awesome. But in order, okay, I'm actually going to leave that over here. There we go. In order to create a for uh, create an application, an application is going to take a lot of stuff. I didn't know my name, what, who I actually want to adopt, things along those lines. So, in order to do that, we need to create inputs. So, the first input is going to be that we're going to be looking at is the text box. In order to create inputs on our website, what we use is the input tag. This input tag, think of it as a shape shifter. If anyone likes Pokemon out there, think of it as a ditto. It can literally transform into so many different inputs. Yes, I'm a nerd. I'm teaching a coding class. Get ready for that. So we're going to be using this input tag in order for it to transform into whatever input we truly want to utilize here in this form. The first one, again, we're going to be using is the text box. 
So what I'm going to be using is that input tag. And then I need to tell my input tag, my ditto, what to transform into. To do that, I'm going to use an attribute called type. Type. In here, we tell it what we want it to be. So inside quotes, I say, I want it to be text, which is of course short for text box. And then we need to give it a few more attributes to really make it unique in itself. Remember, you have a first name, a last name, a home address. You can have a lot of things in text box there. Again, I was on Amazon way too much today. If you had to just fill out one of those forms, you know there are about 15 different text boxes if you're just trying to add a new address. Text box are very common. We need to make them unique from each other. So those attributes we use to do so are name and ID. ID again is that identifier. Name is also a very important one. It's useful in other things that we're gonna be looking at here in the near future. So name and ID. That's why I can't see that. I was like, the thing's covering it. There we go. So let's go ahead and see this in action. What I'm gonna do is come over to our user application and I'm going to go ahead and create our input here. So again, if you're following along, I'm gonna go a little slow on this first one. So input is how I start typing my tag. And then I wanna create a certain type of input, which is gonna be a text box. What attribute, again, turns it into what we wanted to use or tells it what we want it to turn into? That attribute is called type, type. And inside of that type, we type in text. So awesome. I'm gonna save this real quick. We're gonna go and take a close look at it. And we see our text box is there. But remember, this is just an arbitrary text box. We've created it, we won't interact with it just yet, but we need to include two more attributes in here to really give it some uniqueness away from its other inputs. So what we say is name, I'm gonna say username in here. And again, this is up to your creativity. You can call it whatever you want. If you just want it to be name, that's fine too. Just make sure it's unique amongst the other inputs in your form. And then we say ID. It's okay for your name and ID to be the exact same. It's actually very, very useful to do so. So there we go. We have our ID and name in there. Awesome. I'm gonna come back over here. I'm gonna refresh. I see that this is now in there and I'm able to type. Hello, look at that. Very, very cool. One thing if we wanna do it real quick, we can also go ahead and use the label tag to kind of give more information about what this actually is. So I can say your name. we go and refresh and now we have a little your name right there and also include it inside the label too if we wanted to depending on how it is written save that come over here and refresh awesome cool so i'm now able to put my name into this form that's one thing but let's go ahead and keep learning about stuff and see what else we can insert in here let's talk about the checkbox the checkbox is also another type of input in order to create input, we use that input tag. But here is another one. We need to tell it what to transform into. We want it to be a checkbox. So what we say is, I want you to be a checkbox, all lowercase. Again, all inputs need to have identifiers. It really will help you. Trust me when I say they all need to have identifiers here. So we're going to use the name and ID in here as well. I'm gonna change these user input to whatever my true input's actually going to be. So let's go ahead and go over to checkbox real quick. I'm gonna say label, which, I'm like, which dog would you like to adopt? All right. Now for this one, what we can say is input, say type equals, checkbox and then name equals we'll have this one be and we'll have stark in there first oh actually what we're going to do is um dogs check boxes there we go we'll call it dog check boxes and this id is going to be um, the start checkbox. We'll talk about in just a moment why we did two different names there. What I'm gonna do here is copy this checkbox. I'm gonna paste it on a second line. And what I'm gonna do here is checkbox, dog checkbox, but over here it's going to be Bella. 
just like that. So let's go ahead and save this real quick and take a close look at what it looks like. Which dog would you like? Man, it does two check boxes. Come back over here. Sorry. So we see that which check, oh, which dog would you like is on the same line there. So we're gonna format this just a little bit nicer, but we also see it's two check boxes there. And if you want me to zoom in real quick, there we go. It's two check boxes like that. It doesn't give us any information. So if we're check boxes, we need to give it a little bit more info. You actually need to say who, we, who this check box is for. We say Stark there, and we can say Bella here. Save that, we refresh, and now we have check boxes. Awesome, awesome. So I can fill out my name. I want, oh, sorry, Bella, I'm gone for Stark. Awesome, awesome. So there we go, we have our check boxes. Now, one thing I wanted to really talk about is that our names here, when we have a group of check boxes or even radio buttons, we try to keep the names of the same group. Try to keep it of the same group. So we see dog check boxes here because it is of the dog's check boxes, but IDs always have to be unique. So we change the IDs to something different. So remember, if we are doing groups of check boxes or radio buttons, keep the names the same in the group, but keep the IDs unique. Awesome. All right. Now, finally, let's learn about our last one here, the radio button. Of course, it's the exact same setup, but for our type, take close note here, it is for radio, just for radio. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. What I'm gonna say is label. Are you a good person? I feel like that's very informative for a dog application, why not? And then we go ahead and do our input there. So we say type, we say radio, we say name, person check, ID said, Yes, I'm going to say this one's yes. We slash that and say yes. Stop trying to help me, bud. Thank you. Input type. Yeah, have you ever asked, like, Kyle, do you ever just talk to your computer, like, yelling at it because it's trying to help you out? Like, all the time. All of the time. Oh my gosh. All right, name. And then remember, radio button is a group of inputs, just like checkboxes. They, they pertain to the same thing that, the same question, if you will. So therefore we wanna keep the names the same. So we're gonna say person check ID equals said no. Awesome, I will say no there. Save that, oh, wrong way. We come back over here and refresh. Sorry about the separation here, we'll say that, yes or no. And as we can see, these radio buttons are selecting back and forth. We can only select one radio button. But remember, they come pre-selected. So technically your options are zero or one option out of your radio button group. Can you zoom so I can see it all for a quick second? Are we looking at the form or the HTML? Matt, if you wanna just go ahead and type a reply to that one. The form, okay, so there we go. So real quick, what I'm gonna do also to format this a little bit nicer is I'm gonna put divs or BRs, either one, between our labels here, just to make it look a little nicer. BR slash that, BR slash that, there we go. Can refresh that, oh, that looks so much nicer. All right, and there we go, our form is completed. That's awesome. <coughs> Excuse me. Sweet, good, 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 Matt. All right, so we have our form in here. So if I go ahead and type out my name, I would like Stark, and I think I'm a good person, but I'm slightly biased. This is what we are going to do for our form. But the problem is that most forms, we need something to say, I'm done. Please provide this information to whoever requested it, AKA submit my information. So let's go ahead and talk about how we can actually take this information and submit it. Your book mentions it. Um, uh, yes, I can go ahead. I got a quick question for default and for, uh, for default values. I can do it really, really quick. Are you looking for the attribute placeholder? I'm gonna go ahead and mute if anybody else has any other questions about this input. We're not quite done with it. So quick questions, but so, um, I actually real quick, did, I got a real quick, Jody, I, I'm sorry. So, and, and, uh, 
And give me one second, Jody. Uh, and Analia. Analia. Okay, making sure. Analia, when you're talking about default values, are you talking about placeholders, the placeholder attribute, or which attribute are you talking about? Uh, I think I mean placeholders, like, I guess, like the default checkbox or something. I just remember it vaguely in the book. Yeah, I forgot which one sh default checked is. If you want it to be automatically checked or looks always checked, mm -hmm. you can put in the attribute checked here. Uh -huh. Um, for for uh, your text box, you can put in. Uh, for, I'm gonna make. Sure, yeah, I'm going on vanilla here. So, um, for text boxes, so default values depending are dependent on input to input. So, a placeholder for your text box could be your name or something like that. So I'm gonna go refresh this. So we see your name here already printed. So it's kind of like text that shows up. And then we also see start here is checked. So it comes pre-checked. And then you can uncheck it if you want. So those are two different ways to do default values. Is there a specific one you're looking for? No, that was just what I was wondering. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's another one besides placeholder and I'm absolutely sorry, I'm not remembering the attribute off the top of my head. But we can take a closer look at it at the very end if you have any questions. Also, probably in the studio too, we'll probably uh, view some of those things too. Thanks. Awesome question. Yeah, thank you. Um, Jody, I apologize for cutting you off. What's going on? It's okay. Do not forget, um, just a point of, for accessibility, do not forget to add a label to your actual text boxes so that screen readers know what that text box is supposed to be. If you don't add a label, it'll just say edit and it won't tell you what you're supposed to be putting in that field. Yeah, for, for sure. So the attribute you're looking for too, or for anybody out there that wants to add that in there, which is absolutely crucial for any website that's going out there. So yeah, screen readers or anybody that has that certain feature enabled on their machine is called area. So A-R-I-A dash label. So that's assists in the metadata of that form to assist screen readers. So yeah, it's a great call out, Jody. So A-R-I-A dash then there's also many attributes to that attribute so area label is a very common one awesome awesome any other questions out there real quick i can answer before we continue on oh and for that you would also want to include the role attribute with so in like for checkbox or radio button so that the screen reader can again announce the the form field correctly otherwise it won't know that it's a checkbox and i see that all the time on websites where developers forget to do that and basically when that happens jaws won't let you the screen reader won't let you okay. actually check or uncheck the box cool awesome all right just to confirm we're doing it right here is that what you're saying jody or is there something different that we need to than what's no on the you need to do it in the you need to do it in the where you're actually putting the input code you need to make sure to include a role so that the screen reader knows that this is a an actual checkbox and that it can check and uncheck it because yep. things like trello where you remember how it had the check boxes on trello where you could check what you had completed uh there was no role included and it wasn't showing it as an actual checkbox and so jaws which is the screen reader i use would not yep. let me actually check it. Absolutely. So the area area role is also one of the attributes. Like I said, area has many different rules to our many additional attributes to it. Area is essentially the area of where you want to explore for any of those screen readers or for any possible extensions of an application. So yeah, again, Jody, thank you very much for bringing that up. All right. So ARIA for anybody out there interested is the attribute you're looking for. All right, everyone, we're going to have to continue on here so we can get into the input. So like we said, we have this information now on our website, but there is no way to actually send this over to whoever requested it. So we need to find out how can we submit our information. So right now we have all of our stuff together. We have our inputs, but we have no submit button. So one, there's two ways you can create a submit button. I apologize, I have this one here. We're gonna continue using the input tag for this one. So don't pay attention to me, pay attention to this, Kyle. So in order to do that, what we're gonna do is create an input button for our submit. So we say input, we say type equals of submit, and then value equals what we actually want the submit button to say. So that is how we can do that. We say input type submit and value submit the application there. 
So we're going to save this and we're going to take a look at what it does. Oop, I forgot one more thing here. Sorry about anybody reading that. I'm going to put a BR here just so it has a separate line to itself. There we go. So we have our text box, our checkbox, our radio button, and now our submit button. That's great, but the submit button doesn't really do anything. It doesn't submit anything, it doesn't do our, it doesn't even make the page even move. So let's go and explore next what we're gonna be doing with this. Going back over to our example here, we have our four inputs. Again, pretend that our more code is in there. This is a very simplified version of what we were just looking at, including the submit button, but we actually use the input tag instead. If you're gonna ask the, or if you want to ask the question, can your button, your submit button be just a button? Technically, yes, it can. But in most of the applications we're gonna be looking at, we're gonna be using that input variation a little bit more. So when we click that submit button, nothing happens. That's because we have technically created the aspects of a form, but we have not created a form itself, at least in the HTML sense. So when we have all these form elements out there, we need to make sure that HTML contains them or keeps them together. We need to keep these inputs together. We need to keep them inside of our form. In order to do that, we provide the form tag. What this does is it tells HTML that these inputs belong to a form. And when I want you to submit this information, you should submit it together. So it tells us that we need to submit all this information together. So let's go ahead and see this thing in action. What it does, or what we need to do, is provide that form tag there. So we say form. Awesome, awesome. So what I just did is I included this form element here, and I wrapped all of our inputs in it from top to bottom. Not only inputs have to be in here, the inputs just have to be contained within them. You can include your labels and your BRs, divs, et cetera, inside them as well. So let's go ahead and see what happens now to our form instead. When I go ahead and click submit your application, we see that, and it was very, very brief there, and I know internet connections don't always allow us to see it, but our page actually refreshed after the fact. We're gonna take a very, or another close look, really, really, really close here. We're gonna go ahead and press submit application once again. Oop, I actually have to type in information before we do that. Let me go and do that. Oh, I was like, why am I being thrown off here? I'm gonna take out these default values just so I'm not thrown off. There we go. Took out those two things. Refreshed. My name is Kyle Stark, and I'm gonna select yes for, I almost selected no there. Selected yes for are you a good person? And I'm gonna go and press submit the application. Now, did anyone notice it? Can you see what happened? Up here, information was provided inside of the URL. It was injected inside of that URL. This, what just happened is that we sent a request whenever we clicked submit the application. But you can't just take my word for it. Let's go ahead and investigate it really quick. What we can do is right click, press inspect. What I'm gonna do here is also just back out this too, just so we can see the differences there. I'm gonna just go and refresh the page too. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over here to our, over here, remember by, uh, by default, elements is always selected first. What we wanna actually go over to is not console, but over to network, over to the network. Now, once we're on the network tab, we can actually see everything that's going out, all the requests we're sending out from our page, as well as the air correlated responses. So my name again is Kyle. Anyone's already forgotten, I wanna select Stark and I'm gonna select yes. I'm gonna go ahead and press submit the application. Now we saw it very, very briefly, but a request was sent out and then our page refreshed and it came back here. As we can see, our method request was a get, it came back and it showed us this information. That's awesome, but it's really not doing too much. Remember, when we are sending information, what kind of request should we be sending? When we send information, who can remember that? It was almost like 45 minutes ago. What kind of request do we send out if we are sending over information? Thank you. If anybody knows it, feel free to, oh, oh my gosh. Love when I do that. If anybody knows it now, feel free to unmute yourself post, and yell it out. Post. 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 Very good. Everyone's <laughs> like, it's a post, Kyle, post. 
Dang it. The host will not let you unmute yourself. Exactly, because he just wants to sit there. Very good, a post, but by default, by default, your form, when you click the submit button, will send a get request. So we need to change this. We want it to send over a post. So what we need to do is tell our form, when we try to submit our information, send it as a post. So in order to do that, we want to send over the method type of post. We want to send over that request type of post. Those request types are also called methods. Get is a method, post is a method. So what we say is the method attribute, yeah, method attribute of method equals over to post. And we save that. Awesome. Let's go back and see what we just did. Let's go and refresh this one more time. I'm gonna backspace this stuff here. Okay, go, press enter. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna type in my information once again. Press yes, and press send. Oh, it's still coming back to this site and I keep forgetting about that. So we won't, I keep forgetting that we won't be able to see that. Let's see, I'm gonna preserve log, there we go. But the one thing to also note here is that if we look at the very top, we did not actually bring back any of that information. I guess a good thing to call out right now is that when we are doing a get, it will inject the information into the URL bar. But again, when a post happens, we're actually sending that information more under the table to wherever we're trying to send it to. So let's send it here again. Start, press yes. There we go. Now we can actually see it. So what I did was I sent over this request here. Take a close look at what this says. We sent over a request method of type post and 200 means okay. 200 is always awesome. You see a 400 or 500, you might have a bad day, but right now we're seeing the 200. Now we get to see a thing called the payload. The payload is the form information we just sent over there. My username is Kyle, my dog checkboxes is on, and my person check is on as well. So this is the particular information that we're talking about. So for this, what we wanna see here is that this payload being sent over can includes all the information that we have. Essentially what we're trying to send over to wherever it might be. So we might have just enough time for that. If you were trying to send information to a specific place, and actually I'm gonna pause here just for a moment. Any questions on what we just saw as I, of course, close out of it? Any questions here? Before I show one more thing. All right, let's go ahead and do that. A really quick call out here. I don't have anything to really post this information to. We'll be learning that more as we move forward, as well as into unit two, places to post to. If you ever want a specific location, that is called your action. Your action. You might have seen that in your exercises. A really funny handler that they have there. I'm grab it right here. One they have in there. You need to have an endpoint in order to post to. This is the example one they give you in launch code. You don't need to send it over there. But it's kind of funny because they'll send it over there and they'll send back just exactly what you see. Feel free to have fun with this one. I do not have a pet store one for us to work with right now. So this is just a good one as we're working with this and working with into the future. All right. So last bit of thing that I want to do is that what if we do not have our first name filled out or any of this stuff filled out? We want to do some validation. So that is what I want to talk about real quick right now. Now, typically we put this in a separate JS file, but I, I'm gonna just do it here just because our time constraints are getting there. And honestly, it's just nice to scroll back and forth with the HTML. So I'm gonna say script that. Why you didn't give me a second script, but you've been doing it all day, I don't know. Did it spell wrong? Okay. All right, JavaScript, or excuse me, <laughs> Visual Studio, you are not having it. All right. So what we want to do is that we want to create a event listener for when our user presses the submit button. When you are trying to do validation or trying to do any event or just kind of plan out what your plan or what your website is doing, ask yourself, when does the event happen? When do I want to do something? When do I want to validate my form? If we're looking at this form now, I want to validate if they have our name when the user clicks the submit the application button. I don't wanna do it when the window loads. I don't wanna do it whenever they're moving their mouse. I wanna do it when that button is clicked because I know they're done or they're saying they're done. So what I wanna do here is I want to create a 
the event listener for my submit button. In order to do that, I need to first, because I'm up here and I'm not below the button itself, I need to create an event listener first for the window.load event. So I say window.add event listener for load and then my function. If anyone's questioning about exactly why I just did that load there, go ahead and take a look at the last lecture in the last studio um, in order to see why exactly we do that window load method there, or function, excuse me. And so now what I wanna do is actually get my submit button down here and add the event listener there. So in order to do that, I need to have an identifier. So I say ID equals, and I'll just call it submit BTN for button. There we go. So now I'm going to go ahead and add an event listener to that. So what I do is that I can say document dot get element by ID. What I just did is I shorthanded us usually in uh, putting it into a variable and then calling the event add event listener all into one line here. So get element by ID is going to be a submit button. And then hopefully it's found, I'm gonna say add event listener. And I'm going to say on that add event listener, I want it to click. Whenever that click happens, I want this function here that I'm about to write to occur. Now, real quick, I'm going to go ahead and console log and just make sure that everything works. Save that. Come back over to my form here. Refresh. I'm going to go over to my console, click the submit button, and it says I'm here. I'm going to go ahead and also, so we don't get that error again, I'm going to remove my action. All right, there we go. So one thing I wanted to uh, go ahead and do is that we need to, or sorry, the next thing we need to do, so we are now able to, whenever they click the submit button, we're able to see that an event occurs. Awesome. Like I said, for validation, I wanna see if they have anything in that text box. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is I need to go get the text box. So I say, let my text box equals document.getElement by ID. I need to grab the ID of the actual element itself. So that ID is gonna be username. There we go, username. So I now I have that. And the next thing I want to do is actually see what that text box has inside of it. So I'm gonna go ahead and console log my text box dot inner text and see what's actually in there. I'm also gonna make sure so I can actually see it and make sure I'm not doing this wrong. Uh, I'm gonna put text here, there we go. Just like that. I'm gonna come back over here, go back and refresh here and type in that, perfect. Test, and I see, oh, dang, dang, dang. Um, is the name, is the value, is that what I'm looking for? One the text. Oh, input value. Is that what it is? Uh, in uh, is it value? Okay. I see value. Yes, because it's an input tag. All right, there we go. Refresh that. Go now and test that. I'm even going wrong. My text box. Is it input that? I think it's that one, right? I even remember the direct way of getting that out of there because I just drew a blank there. Go ahead and grab that. Uh, so Kyle, um, also with the text boxes, can't you just use the required attribute to show people that it's required? That they, you can not just use the required one. Yeah. yeah, this is more showing it for custom uh, custom validation. Yeah, so why are you not finding, you know, the, yeah, yeah, so Jody, you can absolutely use the required one. That will use your browser's validation. So that's completely fine for some forms. A, a lot of times you'll want to do custom validation, uh, not just the default stuff. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, it is value. So why? I'm going to do this. And, uh, it I think so it's I can actually input see. that value. Um, let me double check some here, and then we'll do that. There we go, and I need to get to this guy. Of course it's happening right at the end of class. Yeah, okay, I was 
I'm going bananas. So real quick, I'm on the input, uh, input dot value. The input most likely in that example that you're looking at is the name of the variable that's getting the text box. Hence why I just kept it as value. So input is most likely whatever is being returned from here. So if we want to see that, we'll just rename that to input and then input here. So what we can do now is that now we can do some validation. We're going to see if this input.value is actually blank. In order to check something, we use a conditional. So we're going to say input.value equals blank there. So there we go. Um, so if that happens, we want to do a console, or excuse me, not console, we want to do a window dot alert there should be text here go and we'll talk about what this is in just a moment there we go let's just make sure this is getting through there so we have this example to talk about save that come back over here refresh send that there should be text in here oh no so there we go we go in and click the submit the application button and it says there should be text in here let's go and type in actually test there and it actually refreshes. This right here is a quick example of validation. I know a few students requested this, so I want to include it at the very end of a lecture. So let's go ahead and talk about what just happened. So what we did here is that we created a event listener for the window because we need to wait for the window to load before we create an event listener for the submit button. Remember, we want to only do validation when it's appropriate. That appropriate time is when we click the submit button itself. Then we add an event listener onto it for click. Remember, I shorthanded this line here. Shorthanded as in I didn't include this to set it, or excuse me, I didn't add this element into a variable before I added the event listener. I can bind the two lines together just to save us one line of code there and to show it. Next, we actually get the username, the element itself using the ID. We check to see if the input has any value inside of it by using that value property that you all very much helped me out with and sees, see if it's empty or equal to empty string. If it is equal to empty string, that is not correct. We want something to actually be in there. We need a name for our applicant. So therefore we show a window.alert. And then we do something, an event.preventDefault. If you missed it, I put event in here into this function. Remember what happens when a button is clicked? An event occurs. An event could be clicking, it could be a mouse over, but also an event in itself is an object full of information and functions to help us out. Every event has a default to it. As in, if I just click on a random button, its default is to do nothing. But a submit button is not just any kind of button, it's a submit button. A submit button's default is actually to submit the form that we saw in the very beginning. It does that get request. Or if we say we want our method to be post, it does that post request. So that is its default action. It's a default, what it will do if we're not, if we don't tell it to do something different. So when it's like I said, the default action of the submit button is to post that information to whatever server is asking for it. If it fails validation, we don't want it to do that. We don't want it to send that information over to the server. So in order to not have it send information over the server, we prevent its default action. Hence using this function called prevent default. So this will stop it from sending over that information to the server, show that alert to the user, and let the user continue to edit the form unaffected. So I know that was a ton of information very, very quickly, and I apologize. So I'm gonna hop over here to these questions, get these read out here. So when do we need to use an event as the argument to the function? Hopefully Grace, I went over that a little bit. Use it when you're trying to do prevent defaults. There's also a couple other ones that we might be seeing here in the next few assignments and uh, exercises and studios. But when you want to use one of the functions inside of this event object, again, such as prevent default, you'll want to include it inside of here. Is it for every event listener? It absolutely is. An event listener, always ask for the event type and then includes an anonymous function. We can include this event, para excuse me, event parameter inside this anonymous function in any add event listener. How the object is shaped depends on the type of event, but prevent default is very common and 
I believe it is in every one, but most likely it is in every single one of the event types. Oh, so that is it for that. Real quick, just for full circle two, we are finished. So I promise there's no more information coming at you if you already have a headache. I apologize, this is a big one. We have a lot of stuff coming at us, but I'm here to answer questions for a few more minutes. Actually, I have a question. What's up, um, The So uh, just it's related to the form. So when when I've been filling out a lot of forms lately, and one of the things I'll see is like, so let's say I tab into a text box field that's like email address. Mm -hmm. If I tab out of that field before I type something, if I'm just looking around, I'll get a thing that says invalid entry. Email address is required. D is that the browser? Um, validation or is that the or is that some custom thing they're doing where if I tab out of a field before typing something it will say uh, this is required basically. so it could be a custom it depends on the browser and it depends on Chrome. what they have in there it in could, okay case. it could be it could be either I don't I don't usually work with the default validation at all um, it could be and most likely a custom validation just because custom validation is much more common um, so that could be that so uh, how does it know I'm tabbing out of a form field? How does it know? So what it is, it's called on blur. So you just blurred an element, AKA you left the element. If you come okay. into an element, that's called focusing on it. So when okay. you tab into something, it's called focus. When you leave it, it's called blur. So oh, it knows okay. exactly when you leave it because that was an event and they're listening for it. And if you don't uh, have anything in there, it's going to say, you don't have anything in here, what's going on? So yeah, it looks like they have an event listener on you leaving that control there for okay. that input. Okay, so yeah. it's blur. Okay, I didn't know what the what the event was called. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. And is there a place where you can look at the methods for the event object? Like, so you can look at the, the methods and the-, the Absolutely. You can... Yeah, just Googling the event object on any JS like event listener, that, that will give you all of it, absolutely. Let's see if I can pull up any here. While I'm doing that, um, I just misspelled that terribly. Um, there we go. I'll go ahead and send it out. So I got a question here from David Gray. So I'm just gonna put this also in the lecture chat channel. If anybody's interested, if my Slack wants to maybe cooperate. Oh my gosh, all right, I'm not gonna be moving there. I'm gonna just put this in here. There we go, David Gray. Is ScriptJS done entirely? Sorry, buddy. Everything's moving around. Is ScriptJS done entirely? Done entirely completed on the client without request. Um, David, can you can you elaborate a little bit? That? I'm I'm gonna assume you're talking about is the ScriptJS. I, I actually uh, can you give a little bit more clarification about what script J, ScriptJS you're talking about? Uh. Just when you're doing event listeners like you did, is that done entirely on the client without going back to the server? Well, yes, absolutely. All events are taking place on your machine, on your machine. So we'll never phone back home for an okay. event listener. Now the event listener itself might tell it to phone back home, but no, everything is done on your machine. All right, thanks. Absolutely. And I would assume that server side, there are event listeners for things like posts and get requests. I would assume that those have event listeners attached to them. It's a cool, it's a, it's a different way of thinking about it, but yeah, absolutely. That kind of listening is happening in the back end. It's not essentially using event listeners per se, but yeah, you're, you're posting something and getting something can be considered an event. So yeah, there's kind of a listener back there listening for that kind of stuff. Um, so I got a question here. Can you show another event with alert for radio or checkbox? Show another event. Um, maybe not in this time, but I believe there's one in the studio. So if you'll come back to studio review and we will definitely take a look at that. If it doesn't, let me know and we can, I'll definitely try to put another example in there just because I'm short on time. Now there's a little bit of extra coding there. So I apologize, I'd only say no. But come back for Studio Roo, and if it's not in there, I will absolutely do one for you. All right, any other last minute questions before I have to send you all off to do your Studio Review? All right, in that case, everyone, that is all we have. <laughs> not much right to it. The internet's simple. So are events and forms and fun stuff. 
in general, this is how everything works on websites. This is how events are useful and how JavaScript truly interacts with our website. So hopefully it was pretty interesting. In the end, the internet now hopefully is slightly more unmasked. So that is all I have for you all today. Thank you again for listening to me and hopefully I'll see you all in studio review. Other than that, have a fantastic week and see you on Thursday. Bye everybody. Thanks guys. Thanks, Thanks Kyle. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you.